other than that, I think we're good to go. You have to remember to unmute, right? <laughs> yeah, and remember to unmute. <laughs> I am guilty of that all the time. Mm. There was a really funny video that I think I've sent you, Ryan, but it's about, you know, the free conference call tool that everybody uses. Um, there's a video that sort of does a spoof on how if meetings were happening in real life on um, using the conference call, like somebody would kind of not be able, you wouldn't be able to hear each other properly and you're sitting in the same room. It's a hilarious video. I'll have to send it to you. Anyone who does remote meetings can definitely appreciate the hilarity of how sometimes technology fails us. <laughs> where, where you are, Ryan? I am in Southern California. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so I just, I just got back from a, a long travel trip and I'm happy to be uh, home for at least the next uh, week or so. So <laughs> it'll be good. And Pedro, where are you located? I'm, I'm in Sao Paulo. Well, the farm, I'm half of my time in the farm. That is uh, uh, two hours from Sao Paulo, two hours and a half from Sao Paulo uh, and uh, countryside. But now I'm, I'm in the office in Sao Paulo, unfortunately. No. <laughs> Uh, that's a, Sao Paulo is a big city, it's a huge city. Uh, yeah. I prefer much more to be in the farm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, I've actually been to Sao Paulo once. It's huge. I couldn't believe the number of tall buildings for miles and miles. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think I'm going to hit broadcast and maybe we could just mute our mics because I'll need a couple of minutes to set up the live stream. So just so that we don't keep people waiting past 12 or whatever time it is where you guys are. <laughs> One. Okay, yeah. so maybe we mute our mics. Okay. Thank you guys. Looking forward to starting. Okay, we'll get started in just a couple of minutes. We'll give people a few more minutes to join the webinar. Great. And we are live on Facebook. Anybody tuning in on Facebook, we're about to get started.
All right. Hello, everybody. Um, can everybody hear me okay? If you can hear me, please confirm in the chat that you can. All right. Thanks, Alana. And folks tuning in from Facebook, I'm just going to check in there as well. All right, great. It looks like you guys can hear us too. Okay, awesome. Let's get started. So thank you all for joining us today and welcome to How Agroforestry Can Boost Climate Resilience and Food Security. Uh, my name is Alexandra Groom. I'm the program coordinator for Grow Ahead. Uh, today we have people joining us from every continent, over 20 countries across all sectors. Are you ready for this? We have people joining us from real estate, renewable energy, jewelers, foundations, farmers, conservationalists, city planners, permaculturalists, firefighters, fitness experts, universities, climate activists, ecological landscape designers, and moms who want to make the world a better place. So I just wanted to mention that because it's super inspiring to see how far-reaching interest in agroforestry is. Um, and we've really seen that interest grow over the past several years um, because of the work that folks like our presenters today are doing. So today we're going to be talking about the science behind agroforestry, the story of a leading agroforestry farm in Brazil, and how agroforestry can support small-scale farmers, as well as potential funding mechanisms to um, fund agroforestry. Um, but before we get started, just a few housekeeping items, the fun part. <laughs> um, so we would, we're would we going to have quite a bit of time for questions and answers at the end, so please post your questions in the chat if you're tuning in on Zoom, or if you're tuning in via Facebook Live, you can post them as a comment. Um, so we will save questions for all, pre all three presentations for the end of the webinar. And finally, this webinar is being live streamed via Facebook Live, and we will be posting the recording and circulating it to anybody who's not able to tune in for the whole thing. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Eric Tonsmeyer, our first speaker. He is a senior biosequestration fellow with Project Drawdown. He's the award-winning author of Paradise Lot and Perennial Vegetables and the co-author of Edible, Food, Edible Forest Gardens. Uh, he's an appointed lecturer at Yale University and has studied perennial plants and their roles in agroforestry systems for over two decades. He's the author of The Carbon Farming Solution, an amazing resource for anybody interested in carbon farming and agroforestry. And today he's going to tell us about uh, Project Drawdown's research on global mitigation and potential of agroforestry solutions. So, Eric, take it, take it away. Great. All right. Hello, everybody. I'm here as a... Um representative of Project Drawdown, where I work, um, although I'm also a practitioner uh, of agroforestry. Um, let's see, so uh, Project Drawdown uh, began about four years ago. Um, uh, we, um, we pulled together a huge international team to look at uh, climate solutions across multiple sectors. Um, uh, sectors like energy, food, women and girls, buildings and cities, land use, transport, materials. Um, and for each of those, we, we gathered in lots and lots of information um, for like how widely are, might something be practiced? How many million hectares are there of this and that practice? How fast are they growing now? What kind of sequestration rates might they show or emissions reduction rates? And our model enables us to generate from that information um, projections on how widely practices might be implement, implemented by 2050 and what the total um, actual climate impact on a global level would be from adoption of, let's say, agroforestry by 2050 and so on. Um, and we, we're also looking at integrating those solutions um, are the waste products of one, raw material for another? Do two take up the same amount of space so they can't compete? Uh, so we made a model of all the world's grassland and cropland and forest to make sure that we're allocating them all but not overusing the world's resources and still leaving land for forest protection and grassland protection and so on. Um, so that was all really fun. So I'll walk through our agroforestry solutions briefly, and then I'll talk about how they did overall in our ranking of solutions. <coughs> Excuse me, the first one is tree intercropping, and this is a really broad category that combines trees with annual crops. We have um, protective systems like, let's say, windbreaks, um, where they might be at the edge of fields or along riparian buffers, and their primary role is to protect the crops or provide some ecosystem services. 
we have um, uh, uh, functional systems where the trees, let's say, are providing uh, nitrogen fixation or uh, erosion control on contour. And then we have productive systems where the trees themselves are crops in terms of producing timber or fruits or other products. In reality, many systems combine all these things. And while there are only so many building blocks of agroforestry, 20 or so, there are an infinite number of um, ways in which they can be combined to create unique systems in any particular place. Hey, Eric, just letting you know if you were planning on sharing your screen, it's not showing yet. Oh, Sorry let's that. try that again. Okay. Sorry, guys. No problem. Well, you got to hear me ramble for a while anyway. There we go. Let's try that. How's that look? There you go. All right. Great. Great. Thanks. Okay. Um, it is more fun to look at pictures than to look at me. I'm absolutely sure of that. Okay. Um, and these are really suited anywhere where we grow annual crops. There's some kind of agroforestry that's, uh, that's, that's suitable there. Um, we estimated there are about 63 million hectares of this globally, uh, but I think we greatly underestimated that. In fact, a new study based on global satellite data shows that uh, almost half of the world's farmland has at least 10 percent tree cover, a cropland. So it's so much more widely um, practiced. And we estimated that uh, we might see maybe 150 to 300 new million hectares of this over the next uh, three decades. Um, and uh, we, the, the sequestration rates for these systems tend to be what I'm going to call low to medium. That is, if you consider conservation agriculture um, or managed grazing to be our baseline, you're typically looking at one ton per hectare or less for those um, widely practiced and widely promoted um, carbon farming practices. And, and for these agroforestry systems, you might be lo looking at that or double that but not five or seven times that. So um, that's a little bit about tree intercropping. Oops. Then we have silvopasture. These are systems where trees are combined with pastures, whether they're planted or allowed to kind of emerge on their own. Um, uh, this is basically practiced anywhere where there's grassland and there is enough moisture to do so. Um, and uh, we estimated about 142 million hectares, which compares to about 12 million hectares of holistic grazing, which you hear a lot more about as a solution, which is a lovely practice and I'm a fan of. But so this is a serious, widely practiced solution. And we figured that we figured out that about 17% of the world's grasslands are humid and another 57% are semi-arid and a great chunk of that is suitable for silvopasture. So, while many grasslands are too dry for this, um, an awful lot of grasslands are suited to silvopasture. Um, we see the numbers uh, somewhere less than doubling, 73 to 136 new million hectares, and sequestration rates are quite high because you have trees growing. Um, and interestingly, for both, for all these agroforestry practices, not only the annual rate of sequestration is higher than the baseline practice, that is to say, compared to managed grazing, which might give you one ton, this gives you almost five tons per hectare per year, but also that maximum long-term storage is higher. So for managed grazing alone, lifetime storage might be 30 to 50 tons per hectare. Silvopasture gives you up to 250. You see similar things with the tree intercropping. The sequestration rates are higher, but the, the long-term storage potential is three to four times higher. So these are really good reasons to grow trees. It's not that it's the only way anybody should be doing this. It's not the only solution. It's not right in all cases, but wherever possible, we should be doing these things because they are very powerful in terms of carbon. Then we have multi-strata systems. This is what Pedro will be talking about. Actually, we have a photo from one of his uh, farms in our book as, a as our image of multi-strata agroforestry. These are systems that have multiple layers of trees with other crops Beneath, essentially everything in there is perennial. Sometimes there's livestock or fungi integrated. Um, currently, these are really limited to the humid tropics on a commercial level, although people are working on developing commercial models in many other climates. That's my life's work here in the US. Um, and uh, it's estimated around 100 million hectares, and we'd like to see another 18 to 44 million hectares of this in place by 2050. 
uh, we project that. And um, even though it's a very small amount of land compared to the adoption of some of other solutions, the sequestration rate here is so, so high that we see a very big impact. Uh, <laughs> this is a typo, that should say seven, seven tons per hectare per year is what we see for this. So this is the most forest-like of all kinds of agriculture and it has the most forest-like sequestration rates and it's often getting irrigation and care that might make it in fact grow even faster than a forest. We often see higher sequestration rates in multi-strata systems than in native forest, in a natural forest. Um, nothing against forest, forest is great, but if we can convert cropland or degraded grassland to this, so much the better. The last one is tropical tree staple crops. Um, the World Agroforestry Center now considers tree crop production a kind of agroforestry. Um, these are trees that produce not fruits or, or other things you might think of, but really the, the protein and carbohydrates and fats that humanity depends on for our staple foods. And we, our definition of this includes that it has to be done by converting cropland, not by cutting down forests. So if you cut down forests to plant avocado or oil palm, terrible for carbon. But if you're converting grassland to cropland, fabulous. Currently, the, these are really limited to the tropics in that that's where the yields of perennial staples are equal to or better than the yields of annual crops. There's about 47 million hectares of this now around the world. We'd like to see that double or triple. Um, and the rates of growth are very fast right now, uh, currently, although a lot of that's from forest conversion. Uh, sequestration right here is about four and a half tons per hectare. So we see this as a huge and really, really undersung uh, potential. In my, when my other book, In the Carbon Farming Solution, I do go through, um, you know, five or six chapters on these species and lay out their potential. I'm a big, big believer in the potential of these crops. So how do they score? How do these rank? When we look at our, on the left side there, you can see Drawdown's top 10 solutions across all sectors. And silvopasture was the highest ranked agricultural solution. So it does less than reducing food waste. Reducing food waste is awesome. Educating girls is awesome. Uh, wind power and solar and so on are awesome. But silvopasture we found was the highest ranked. And on the right here, you can see um, the agricultural solutions ranked. Again, silvopasture, the highest ranked of those. Um, and in purple, you can see our other uh, agroforestry solutions, all very, very well represented and um, really um, driving home the point that while they are not the only agricultural solutions that matter, they are very, very important. And, and it's my feeling that they don't get their due um, when we talk about agricultural climate change mitigation. We need to, to really... Um, uh, put them right in the center of things uh, because of their intense power on a per hectare basis, because of their wide uh, practice already around the world, because they're well studied and not really controversial in terms of their impact, and because of their long history. And finally, because of their impact on climate justice, many of the people who are practicing these um, agroforestry practices are based in the tropics who are the people who are most impacted by climate change and did the least to cause it. So uh, finance towards agroforestry in that sense uh, helps to address climate justice and pay carbon debt. So uh, if you're interested in more, you can check out Drawdown's book. Uh, and also on our website, we have technical summaries for each of these solutions that give a lot of details and the math behind them. We have a sector summary for food overall. All of our rankings are there and lots of references and resources. So that is a very broad overview. <laughs> and uh, I'll stop sharing and we can move on to the next one. Thanks, Eric. There's just so much to talk about with regards to this. It's quite incredible, the potential of agroforestry as a climate solution, not to mention all of the co-benefits. So thanks for giving us a broad overview. I think we could probably spend days <laughs> on a webinar talking about this. Um, but so yeah, we'll have plenty of time at the end. If folks have any questions, please post them in the Q&A or on the Facebook comments. We'd love to, to discuss afterwards, after the presentation. So um, next up, we're gonna hear from Pedro Diniz. Pedro is an agroforester, businessman, and formula, former Formula One race car driver. Uh, Pedro transformed his family farm into Fazenda da Toca, a large 
scale organic farm in Brazil's Sao Paulo state and one of the country's leading producers of organic eggs and fruits. He's hopeful that through large scale organic and biodynamic production of healthy plants and animal products, uh, the farm will become a catalyst for sound rural development and environmental regeneration in Brazil and beyond. Um, today, Pedro will be talking about partnering with nature to create profitable and regenerative agricultural systems. So Pedro, please share your screen with us and get started. Thanks for joining us. Hello, everyone. Hi, hello, everyone. Let me try to share the screen here. Uh, just a second. That's it. Now, just one second. Why this not appearing? Uh, share the screen. Great. Great. Yeah. That worked. Thanks. Um, you seen that? Yeah. yeah. Well, briefly, uh, what is Fazenda Toca? Fazenda Toca is a farm that it's with my family uh, for since 1970s. Uh, uh, Coincidence or not is the year that I born. So I had a great, uh, uh, big relationship with this farm because I, I spent uh, uh, all my early years there. And but uh, then I moved to Europe. I lived in eleven years in Europe. I lose, I lose a little bit of the, the contact with the farm. Uh, and uh, when I come back to Brazil, uh, uh, my family wants some, someone to to do something different in the farm. Then I study a little bit. I didn't know anything about agriculture, but I was really into um, sustainability and uh, to organic food and. Um, um, healthy, healthy food and stuff. So uh, I decided to do organic project there in the farm, and uh, it turned up to uh, organic uh, agroforest project, um, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, just to share a little bit uh, what it's it's my view on agriculture um, and a view of the problems of the world. I mean. Uh, Probably everybody that is watching know this uh, this data is better than me, but um, forty percent of the one third of the soil of the planet uh, uh, is being vanished. Uh, Thirty percent of the food production is waste. Uh, a billion people starve and uh, obesity epidemic is it's it's a big problem right now. Um, but one data that really shocks me is that uh, after the World War. Uh, that I saw that in a presentation of Michael Pollan, and that was a data that really shocks me. In night after World War, World War, used to use one calorie of oil to produce 2.3 calories of food, and today we need 10 calories of oil to produce one calorie of food. So that's the evolution that we had on the on the food production and i think that's uh, uh, that's pretty shocking for me so we need really to evolve to a agriculture that is more sustainable really to uh, in in what uh, what i'm i'm really uh, uh, really really um, optimistic is that uh, studying that and from the 10 years that uh, I'm, I'm working there on Fazenda Talker, I'm really sure that we can really not only produce sustainable food, that we can produce regenerative food in, in the sense that we can regenerate our planet producing food. So um, this, uh, you already know that uh, we, we live in the six max extinction. And um, for me, it's not only the problem of uh, carbon in the atmosphere or climate change, uh, biodiversity for me, Maybe it's even a, a, a same same problem, even a bigger problem than than uh, CO two and atmosphere and carbon and, and climate change. And uh, we decreasing biodiversity in levels that uh, we never saw before. And it's uh, it's really for me, it's a big problem. And agriculture probably is the it's the great villain for that. Um, in in my view, well, agriculture is a problem today and can be a big solution. So uh, it, agriculture is consuming 70% of the water of the planet, is responsible for one third of the greenhouse emissions. Uh, uh, farming takes up to 40% of our land. 
Uh, and in Brazil is our, uh, that's not very nice from Brazil, but Brazil is the largest consumer of pesticides. Uh, that's uh, the environment that the, I live. Um, so in sharing a little bit what we, we've been doing there on Fazenda Talk is that uh, really that uh, we started to produce um, organic food. And uh, at the beginning, we were really trying to produce organically and uh, kind of uh, uh, using with the same mentality of uh, producing conventional food. Uh, trying to substitute the enzymes and uh, instead of putting um, chemical fertilizer, we're putting compost and uh, um, and we we we, uh, we came to a conclusion that that that's really expensive and doesn't really quite work. Uh, and then we start to study and uh, we had a help from the Swiss guy that really inspired us, Ernest Ernest Gutch, and he. Uh, really inspired that in, into looking to nature and understand how nature operates and the intelligence that it's in nature and forests and try to inspire ourselves to see what kind of solution of nature's uh, really used to um, to deal with the problems and uh, uh, and to make uh, the systems much more effective and uh, more profitable. So. Um, just talking a little bit of this top, uh, I mean, in, a, in, in our systems there, we use uh, very low fertilizers. Uh, we capture much more water, we create a lot of, a lot of carbon, uh, and we produce actually biodiversity. Um, uh, I think this slide is not. Uh, this, this picture, I think, by seeing, it's a picture of uh, our soil. Uh, on the left here, it's our soil at the beginning, uh, before we start to intervene, uh, and that's two years afterwards. We didn't put any compost on the soils. This is only organic material from the place. So with our systems, we transform a very unfertile soil to this kind of uh, uh, fantastic soil in only two years. Of course, we are in the tropics here. The climate is uh, very good for that. But I mean, that's really uh, give me a lot of hope because really we can uh, transform uh, and regenerate places, you know, pretty fast actually. Um, so this array I mentioned that it really our systems, what we do really try to understand how nature deal with problems and try to mimic in a productive productive uh, systems. Um, uh, right, he, he mentioned that a uh, 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 silver pastoral it's a solution that it's um, uh, it's uh, it's very effective, and we saw that in Brazil. In Brazil, we have uh, 210 million hectares in uh, between uh, 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 raising cattle and uh, grains. Uh, that's a lot of land and uh, what we're doing right now our latest research is uh, trying to mix multi-strata agroforest with silver pasture and uh, uh, we saw in our first data that we're having from that that it's I mean the impact of that is huge and the potential to grow of that in Brazil is uh, enormous so uh, we modeling right now and we have some uh, experiments already in Fazana Toca. And what we're doing, we, uh, we're going to expand uh, the models that we have in Fazana Toca. That's for fruit, fruit production. Most of our agro agroforestry system there in Fazana Toca is a multi strata agroforestry, but more for fruit production, uh, tropical fruits, mainly limes. Uh, but uh, what we're doing now, it's uh, modeling these new systems that is a huge potential uh, in Brazil. Uh, this picture here, it's a picture of uh, our production of uh, limes. Uh, as you can see in the middle, uh, we have a grass, uh, that's brachiaria grass. Uh, that's a part of the system. Uh, that's a really important part of the system. What we do, we use this uh, in intermediate line, the midline here, to create uh, organic material uh, for the production line. Uh, as you can see here, that's, uh, uh, that's a picture 
uh, a, a similar place uh, that uh, it's been uh, chopped. Uh, we do that in, in the winter. Uh, we cut everything and we put a lot of organic material on our lines of production. Uh, we, 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 all, we cut all the trees and we put everything down uh, that produce more light in the winter time that's, uh, that's important and produce uh, what is special is a lot of organic material and that's dropped quite a lot of cost of production because we don't need to put uh, so much uh, input from outside like a compost. Um, uh, that's Mainly, what is our models uh, for for expanding? We're expanding for 400 hectares uh, of uh, these uh, lime productions in Fazenda da Toca. Uh, but uh, with the civil pastoral, uh, it's a much bigger uh, and ambitious goal that I'm going to share in a minute. Uh, that's uh, the system uh, with three years, then uh, with nine years. Um, uh, then uh, with 18 years that we're going to cut this uh, African mahogany. Um, talking a little bit of our vision for the future, it's uh, really to turn Brazil uh, into the biggest uh, powerhouse of uh, organic regenerative agriculture in, in the planet. Uh, Brazil has this uh, trophy of uh, being the biggest country of uh, using of agrochemicals. And... Um, uh, it's a huge uh, agriculture production in Brazil. We have 280 million hectares uh, of agriculture in Brazil. Uh, from this two, 280, as I mentioned, 210 million hectares, uh, it's uh, uh, pasture, mostly degraded pasture and production of grains. So that's huge. And uh, uh, that's why now we are concentrated in uh, ha having a solution of mixing uh, the multi strata agroforestry with a silver pasture. And uh, we're seeing the results of this uh, in all the terms in financial terms, in um, re regenerative terms, in creating biodiversity, in uh, uh, resilience. Uh, it's enormous and uh, we are very optimistic on that. We are already doing some experiments on Fadena Toca and our goal for, uh, well, our moonshot, it's uh, to have a, in maximum 10 years, a million hectares of, uh, of this uh, silver pasture, uh, multi-strata silver pasture. Um, and uh, that's called here in Brazil is integration. Um, well, how are going to translate Lavora Pecuaria Flores? It's ELPF, but I'm uh, going to be able to translate that to, to English. But uh, uh, it's integration, basically, uh, um, uh, pasture and uh, grains. Um, and it's, there's a huge potential and, uh, to produce uh, uh, real, real food in a, a very regenerative way in producing biodiversity. Um, uh, our, our purpose really uh, on Fazenda Toca is really to connect and co-create initiatives to help the regenerative systems. Why we say to uh, connect and co-create? Because we, we've been seeing these past years um, that uh, uh, it's very important to connect uh, and uh, to integrate with, with other agriculture uh, uh, projects and uh, to other people that are doing that. Uh, to really co-create solutions because the solution is not ready. Uh, what I've seen that we, everything that we've been doing for the past 10 years and for the talk uh, really was uh, really, really difficult uh, because the, the solution is not ready yet. We had to do a lot of R&D uh, and um, uh, really doing it together with other in initiatives and uh, co-creating solutions. That's really our, our purpose and our goal. And uh, we're doing that, and we, uh, I'm very happy to say that uh, we're having a lot of success. Uh, our production here is doing very well so far, and um, I'm very optimistic that a really uh, regenerative agriculture and agroforest systems is really the solution to, to make humankind really uh, prosper in a very nice way in this planet. I think that's it that I have to share right now. Thank you, Pedro. Um, it was amazing to learn more about Fazenda da Toca. It's such an incredible project and looking forward to digging into some questions after. Um, so let's, let's move on to the next presenter. 
Um, yeah, you can uh, click stop sharing screen if you want. Stop sharing. Yeah. Um, okay, so next up, we're going to hear from Ryan Zinn uh, on crowdfunding for climate resilience. So Ryan Zinn is the organic and fair trade coordinator for Dr. Bronner's and director for Grow Ahead. He's been involved in the food justice movement at home and abroad for over 20 years, including work with organizations such as the Center for International Environmental Law, Friends of the Earth, Paraguay, Global Exchange, and Farewell Project. Ryan, thanks so much for joining us today. Very good. Thank you so much, uh, Alex. And I also want to thank uh, uh, Pedro and Eric for their fantastic presentations. Very inspiring and um, really great information that I think uh, is very useful. So let me figure out how to get into full screen and we shall get started. How does that look, Alex? Looking good. Okay, great. Well, first of all, thank you all for, for joining us today. This is a very exciting topic and I'm really excited to be able to, to share the, the stage with uh, other great presenters. And what I wanted to do is give a little bit of a background about um, our organization, Grow Ahead. Um, which was founded several years ago as part of an initiative through Cooperative Coffees, a group of fair trade and organic coffee importers in North America. And their goal was to really help finance um, coffee cooperatives' ability to produce fair trade coffee um, and launch this platform back before um, some of the crowdfunding programs really um, took root. And, uh, and over time, you know, fair trade coffee cooperatives were able to actually sort of develop their own lines of credit and access the markets in a different way, and really the need for that platform wasn't as important. Um, and it's about two years ago, um, through the Fair World Project, we approached um, Cooperative Coffees and Grow Ahead to redirect the mission um, towards supporting small-scale farmer or farmer-led initiatives to address climate change and really climate resiliency at the farm level, primarily throughout the, the underdeveloped world. Um, because we saw in, in conjunction with our, our surveying of producer organizations, a real need to, to address that at the local level. So I think, um, as Eric and Pedro have, have mentioned, really, you know, the, one of the biggest challenges we face when addressing climate change is the fact that industrial agriculture um, is really one of the major drivers of greenhouse gases. Um, and it's a very inequitable food system. It causes quite a bit of hunger. It's not exactly efficient. Um, and what we really see through both our sort of day-to-day -day interactions with producer organizations, um, but certainly the data shows this as well, um, small-scale farmers, um, which make up the majority of the world's farmers um, on anywhere between, you know, very small plots to, to one to five hectares perhaps, um, really provide the vast majority of the food, particularly for the underdeveloped world, and in doing a way in a way that's really, um, you know, that, that supports really um, climate sequestration, or at least doesn't generate as much greenhouse gases as large industrial agriculture. And, and really in the context of, um, you know, land use, uh, what we've noticed is that particularly in many uh, countries throughout um, the underdeveloped world, we're seeing greater and greater um, rates of deforestation to make way for industrial agriculture, uh, particularly for, you know, monocultures like, you know, BMO soy, for example, or for, for pasture, for, for uh, livestock. Um, and what we see, you know, as, as Eric has pointed out, and certainly as Pedro has mentioned in their experience, um, this approach to agroforestry um, is, is one important way to step forward to not only address things like food security and hunger, um, but also can have a big impact in terms of uh, sequestering carbon. Um, as, as Eric has pointed out, we see this, this combination of approaches through, through multi-strata, agroforestry, intercropping, and civil pasture as really important steps. And, and our goal really more than anything else is to come up with um, methods and pathways to support those organizations and small farmers that are really looking to expand these models um, locally in the communities where they work. And so what we did in conjunction with the Latin American Fair Trade Network um, several years back in the run up to the um, Paris uh, uh, COP um, was conduct a survey with producer organizations to see what efforts they were doing on the ground to be able to not only stabilize their, their economies and their farms and their organizations um, you know, facing climate change, but really what were the, those methods and projects and initiatives that they were coming up with to really address this on the ground. And, and what we found was a wide array of, of solutions in many cases that had many, many co-benefits. It helped um, stabilize the local economy, provided some money or some, some, some uh, production for cash cropping, um, but also allowed for a way to protect biodiversity and uh, really create important niches um, within the ecosystem. 
Um, and so our goal um, as a result of this sort of research and engagement with producer organizations was come up with different approaches through crowdfunding to really meet the, the, the needs that we're seeing on the ground. And part of this is our goal to plant um, one million trees in, in really agroforestry systems um, in support of small scale farmers um, by 2020. Um, and one of the things that we've been sort of anal analyzing internally and in conjunction with other partners is that, you know, as we talk about this notion of, of regenerative agriculture, which is certainly one of the, the latest buzzwords of, of the day, there's a number of ways we need to sort of uh, um, support that process. Certainly what we're seeing in the United States these days is increased education for sure. Um, there's more and more market demand, um, particularly in the organic and the, and the natural food sectors, which are very important. Um, but really to get there, the, the foundation is um, support for, for funding um, for producer organizations um, and capacity building, which is basically training um, for farmers. Um, especially since what we've noticed is that there's a, a really core generation of farmers you know, throughout the world that um, thanks to the technology like the Green Revolution, for example, or the fact that farming just wasn't, you know, meeting uh, their, their needs, there's been sort of this gap in traditional knowledge. Um, and so our goal is to help really tap into that existing traditional knowledge um, and support that through, through training. Um, so basically what we do at Grow Ahead are a couple of things um, through, through crowdfunding. One, um, we support farmer to farmer capacity building trainings. Um, this really grew out of the farmer to farmer movement um, throughout Latin America, primarily in the 1970s through Central America, um, into Southern Mexico, and then really um, have been a couple of great examples of this in places like Cuba, for example, which, you know, farmer to farmer was really recognized as, as one of the, the vehicles for expanding out organic um, training to, to farmers throughout the country. And we see this in other parts of the world as well, for example. Um, like in India with the zero budget natural farming movement where they've been able to train hundreds of thousands of farmers in agroecological approaches. And so really our goal is to be able to uh, provide the funding and resources to bring farmers together in a way that they can actually tackle some of these issues on, on the ground. And you know, we've done this um, just a, a few months ago in Nicaragua um, and we're looking to launch a few more crowdfunding campaigns to support these efforts um, you know, in, uh, in Latin America, Africa and Asia. Um, and one thing that we've noticed as well is that there's a, a real need to really support um, um, eager and uh, willing um, farmers, particularly women farmers, um, to gain additional training that they can then take back to their organization. So we've launched a, a regenerative organic agriculture scholarship program, and we recently just funded 10 scholarships um, with a fair trade coffee co-op in Honduras called Pomsa. Um, and that's something we continue to focus on going forward, um, primarily supporting women farmers. Um, we will be launching our, our revolving loan program for those organizations looking to develop um, capacity um, for capital, for example, if they were looking to develop a nursery or a compost operation, all things that really address this issue of climate resiliency, um, they might be able to access those funds through the loan program. And then lastly, um, you know, the, one of the big, biggest things we're excited about now is, is the opportunity for uh, consumers, primarily in northern countries, but North America in particular, um, the ability to support um, agroforestry efforts through, through tree planting in that fund that we've just recently set up. Um, and so I, I won't go into any more about sort of the benefits of, of agroforestry systems, as, as Eric and Pedro have already done so. Um, but what we've noticed that is that there's a real important need for farmer organizations to be able to access funding um, to really develop these agroforestry programs, particularly since they are um, living um, in areas of, of degraded land, for example, or quite frankly, aren't unable to access the, the, the finances, the financial needs to be able to develop these programs locally. And there's things like established nurseries, um, have training, um, and build up those programs. And I, I should note that, you know, within the Project Drawdown um, book, they, they, they noticed that, you know, on average, you can, you know, sort of bet that it's going to cost about $1,000 U.S., um, give or take, uh, to be able to establish one hectare of uh, you know, a solid agroforestry system. And so our goal is to be able to support those farmers as they do and to really build up that capacity locally. And we're in the process of launching our first program in Peru that will come out um, probably in the next couple of weeks and we like to support other organizations that they build out in the coming weeks and months. Um, no need to, to, to go any further on this. I wanna make sure that there's enough time for uh, questions and conversation, but certainly agroforestry has many, many co-benefits. Um, and this is something that we see as uh, um, our, our campaigns are a way to sort of meet the demand that the producer organizations are, are, are asking of us. Um, and lastly, our approach really is 
um, recognizing our limits. We're a small NGO, um, and, and really, our goal is to really inspire and support those efforts that are being carried out by small-scale pharma organizations throughout the developed world, and really act as a way to, to really pollinate um, that traditional knowledge and that capacity building out beyond their organization. So we work with organizations that primarily focus on training others, um, not only in their community, but, but throughout the regions as well. And so our goal is to really leverage uh, the, the amount of money that we could actually raise so that we can have a bigger impact and scale out the benefits of agroecology and agroforestry throughout the regions. Um, and we do this through a couple of different ways. It's we're, we're partnering with um, certainly ethical and natural based businesses, for example, to raise those funds to support those producers in their supply chains. Um, obviously, crowdfunding is a big critical opportunity that we see and people can give or donate directly. Um, and then for those producer organizations and farm leaders, we have mechanisms um, to be able to apply for funding. Um, and they can find those on our, our website. Um, and just to give you a little bit of a, an idea here, are some of the organizations that we've partnered with um, in the last couple of months uh, to support our programs, um, everything ranging from you know, importers to producer organizations, um, and then you know, factories, things like that. Um, and with that, um, I will uh, pass it back to Alex. I wanna thank everybody again um, for the, this great presentation, and uh, hopefully we can open up for some uh, questions and dialogue going forward. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot, Ryan. Um, thanks for taking the time to join us to tell us more about Grow Ahead today. Um, super inspiring project supporting the small scale farmers of the world. Um, well, so we have plenty of time for Q&A. Super excited. Um, I'd like, we have a couple of good questions. If others have questions, please post them in the chat or as comments on Facebook. Um, but here's one that we can start with. I'd like to do a round with our, our panelists. And okay, so here's the question. Um, so Project Drawdown estimates, Eric, you mentioned this, that agroforestry adoption is going to increase rapidly um, in the future. What are going to be the key drivers of widespread adoption? Where in the world are we going to see the most adoption, aside from in Brazil, thanks to all the amazing work that Pedro is doing and their goals? <laughs> um, what size farms are going to be adopting agroforestry and what other avenues are there for funding? So I know that's a, a lot of questions, but I'd love to do a round to talk about kind of the future of this field and how we're going to see it grow. Um, Eric, do you want to kick us off? I can try and give the one minute answer, sure. Um, well, the first thing is that agroforestry is already growing very rapidly. Um, there's this, this uh, paper by Zomer that looked at the global spread of agroforestry, found that in almost all countries it's spreading rapidly, and globally it's spreading about 2% per year. So it's already spreading. Um, and I think the key, uh, there's a number of uh, barriers preventing farmers from being able to establish uh, agroforestry. One is if you don't have good tenure on your land, why would you spend money and wait years until something makes you money back? It doesn't work. So land tenure for farmers. Um, and another is just those establishment costs, which are was fun to run those numbers for drawdown. It's great to see Ryan using those. It just costs more than doing some other things and it takes longer to pay you back. We estimated most agroforestry systems on average take about six years um, to really start to make money for you. So we need, we need a robust finance system, a diverse robust finance system, set of finance systems to, to assist farmers to make that transition. And that could come through um, national payment for environmental service. It could come like, uh, you know, government payments. Uh, it could come through um, preferential access to markets. It could come through, um, uh, premium prices through certification systems. It could come through um, special finance pools of money. It could come through crowdfunding. So uh, I think that's really key. And also, I think just in the in the public eye, and the cons we need the consumer demand to happen. Um, and we're beginning to see that happen. We we don't yet have the aggregation of agroforestry producers. Like you buy food in the store all the time that was grown on an agroforestry farm, but you would unless it's certified shade grown coffee, you would never know. It just looks like rice or it just looks like potatoes. So we need a way to, to aggregate farm producers into associations so that we can sort of preserve that identity all the way through the consumer and allow the consumers who have the ability, who have the, the money, the resources, and the, the interest to, to – um, uh, support that kind of production. That's a very short, rambly set of thoughts there. We can move on to the next person. No, that was great. Thanks, Eric. Uh, Pedro? Oh, here, you're on mute. I'm going to unmute you. 
Okay. There you go. Uh, just taking for, for this comment from Eric, uh, we see, yeah, I agree completely that uh, on our fruit production, uh, really the payback for uh, its, uh, its uh, long uh, invest in first investment, it's, uh, it, it's pretty long in, in lime trees, for example, it takes four years to start production on lime trees. And that's a big pro problem uh, because you need a lot of money to, to, to do this kind of uh, uh, integrated system. And, uh, but uh, we studying two solutions to, to deal with that. Uh, first of all, by integrating uh, short crops, crops like manioc, uh, uh, fruits that uh, you can have uh, from less than one year, you, you really change a little bit the profile of this uh, uh, of the income of money uh, on the systems and reduce quite a lot the uh, the need of capital for that, and uh, uh, the payback starts to to get much better. And what we see, uh, the other thing that we really uh, optimistic and excited about it. It's, uh, it, it, it's what I mentioned of uh, putting livestock into the uh, multi-strata agroforests. It's, uh, it's the term now, I have it's integrated crop livestock forestry system. Uh, I translate that. <laughs> uh, and it's uh, that we're really excited about that because we're introducing livestock on the multi-strata agroforestry. You really make the profile of uh, really uh, uh, of uh, of the return on investment much quicker and uh, and we seen IRRs uh, we dealing in between fifteen to twenty IRR, real RR in this system so that's really good and uh, we're very excited with that so it's really we could prove that in, we think going to be able to prove that in the next two years that really this kind of systems has this kind of RRs. Uh, and uh, so I think the adoption is going to be huge in Brazil, especially. Okay, thanks, Pedro. We have a, another question for you. If you could just restate the figures behind your moon shoot, um, I think your 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 goals is what Dan yeah, and Don was referring the moonshot, to. The moonshot for our next ten years. Uh, I'm pushing my team to be less than the ten years, but uh, by doing partnerships and uh, uh, having partnerships with other farmers and simulate other farmers, our moonshots for the next ten years a million hectares uh, of this uh, multi-strata uh, together with the livestock. Uh, we think there is a huge potential in Brazil. If you think there is only with a uh, uh, livestock, it's uh, 180 million hectares and uh, um, crop systems, grains, uh, uh, it's another 40 million hectares. So that that gives uh, 210 million uh, or 220 million hectares uh, of, um, uh, of area. So uh, talking about a million hectares only <laughs> is not that much, but uh, never been done. Uh, uh, but I think that is really the potential uh, and makes a lot of sense. If we prove that it could have this kind of IRR, I mean, that's a no brainer that uh, we should have a lot of uh, adoptions. So I am um, pushing my team to have uh, this uh, million hectares earlier than 10 years. <laughs> Good job. Nice. Um, Ryan, do you have any comments on the the question of what are the key drivers of, of widespread adoption of agroforestry. Um, and then in addition to that, I think there's a, a question that's relevant to you. Uh, how vital is working with cooperatives and how much more turnkey does that make your operations? Making sure I'm unmuted. Well, I, I, I do think, you know, there's a lot of opportunity and good momentum right now. I, I do think one of the missing elements to, to help drive the, the commercial case for agroforestry perhaps is tapping into government procurement programs. So, so long as you're able to provide a market for many of the crops um, that farmers can actually produce, then there's a little bit more stability. I mean, agroforestry is not a silver bullet or, or anything along those lines, but we need to look at it from the context of, of reality within you know, sort of the marketplace. And I think by being able to provide fair prices through procurement and other programs, that might provide some, some important drivers to actually you know, cement some of the, the progress made so far. And, and as far as our approach, what we found is by working with organized small scale farmers, um, that really provides a good launch pad for, um, you know, scaling out the, the, the traditional knowledge and the capacity building um, beyond working with individual farmers. And um, in that particular case, in many cases, they actually have sort of a, a commercial um, driver as well. So that means that any decisions that they make 
um, will actually incorporate that, but not making them so dependent upon like an external market for, for, for cash, for example. If that makes sense. Yeah. Thanks, Ryan. Um, yeah, well, well, oh, go ahead, Pedro. Yeah. yeah uh, uh, first of all, I, I love the, the presentation of uh, both Eric and Ryan. I didn't mention that, I forgot that. But uh, in, in talking about what Ryan uh, share, we really think also smallholder farmers is uh, it, it's a big solution. We just not really concentrated on that because really the paradigm in Brazil is huge farms and a huge agriculture. So we had to choose how to to operate, and we we choose to operate to have solutions for uh, big eggs. Uh, and um, the, in our systems, uh, when we're thinking about a big farm. Uh, we're thinking about integrating families inside of the farms and maybe in doing partnerships with, with, with these families in kind of an integrated project with families. Uh, talking about Fazenda da Toca, in 2,300 hectares, we have 60 families that live in there and we create a kind of a, a, a village there that uh, there is uh, these 300 people that live in there. And we have a school there that teaches uh, the kids, the small kids from our, our employees and our partners, uh, how nature operates. And uh, we kind of have a kind of uh, um, uh, our, our system of uh, uh, teaching of the school. It's uh, eco-literacy. So really to understand how nature operates and uh, how, how, uh, how things work in the planet. So that's very important. I think that's linking to, to the question is that's, uh, that education is a key issue to really to make the adoption faster also because uh, not only the kids that is learning in our school but uh, uh, we do a lot of events and uh, courses in the farm uh, to really to to share to all the publics to show how what is really the potential of regenerative farming and agroforestry and agroecology and um, I think that's uh, very important education is a key thing. Uh, to make this move faster and uh, changing the paradigm of agriculture in the world. Thanks, Pedro. Um, yeah, Fazenda da Soca is such an amazing model of a larger scale farm and the work you guys are doing with families and communities, it's really amazing. So um, thank you for giving us a bit more background into that. Um, so we have a, another question that I think would be great perhaps for all of you, maybe Eric specifically. Or Pedro, um, how expensive is agroforestry implementation compared to conventional agriculture? Uh, why isn't adoption happening in the U.S.? Uh, let's see. Well, there is some adoption happening in the U.S., but we may be the worst place in the world for agroforestry adoption, I suspect. There's certainly some. Um, and there's a, a um, North American Agroforestry Association the Association for Temperate Agroforestry, that is mostly U.S. and Canada. Um, and that's a good place to get plugged in if you want to meet people who are doing it here. Um, let's see. The the um, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but in terms of the establishment costs, um, uh, getting started in agroforestry, it varies hugely. Some systems are free. Farmer managed natural regeneration, which is one of the most rapidly spreading forms of agroforestry in the Sahel region in Africa, is free. You just let the tree seeds that came into your field and the tree roots that were in your field sprout up and you manage them. That's free. So <laughs> that'll be the low end. Um, uh, we do see the, um, the uh, establishment costs of, let's say, silvopasture and tree intercropping systems often coming in somewhere around um, uh, $500 to $1,000 a hectare in the multi-strata systems. More, we look at around uh, 2000 US $2,014 per hectare, although, again, there's huge, huge variation. The, when compared with just adding cover cropping to your farm, it's more expensive. Uh, when compared to just uh, changing the stocking rates of animals in your pasture, it's more expensive, but the impacts are also much greater, not only the carbon impacts, but also biodiversity and all these other very important ecosystem services. Um, it's something that uh, our economic system doesn't really value just yet, and we need to, it's part of the project to make uh, that come into the, the fore. I think uh, here in the U.S., um, uh, 
the barriers are not so much economical, although that's certainly a challenge. I think it's more um, a barrier in the mind of many farmers and in the mind of many of the service providers, the um, Natural Resource Conservation Service or other folks you might work with at university. And there are USD Department of Agriculture programs. If there's an agriculture, there's an agroforestry department, and there's agroforestry solutions within our National Payment for Environmental Services program, and so on. But it's not really in the four of most people's minds. So we have to do some very basic work here, I think, to get it on the radar screen at all for um, um, in order to be able to have an impact. And there's a lot of people excited about this next farm bill, which is every four years we redo our national ag, some of our national agricultural policy. Um, there's a lot of people working on getting a climate mitigation really in the center of that. And uh, agroforestry is certainly um, uh, playing an important role in that in the discussion, at least as it is so far. So we may see some big changes here over the next decade or so as a result of that. Nice. Thanks, Eric. Uh, Pedro or Ryan, do you have anything to add? Pedro, I have I have something to add. Uh, just I agree with Eric completely, but uh, just one comment to that that I think uh, is relevant is that, uh, I mean, the cost of implementation uh, uh, of this uh, regenerative agriculture and multi-strata agroforests uh, 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 with uh, uh, livestock, et cetera, it's, it's higher. Um, but uh, we don't have a specific lines uh, to promote that, uh, especially in Brazil. And I think even uh, worldwide, we've been looking for it's not really specific lines of credit to promote that and to stimulate that. Uh, so I think that is something that it's really uh, society has to start to uh, to really uh, incentivize governments to to promote that because. Uh, uh, the service that uh, this system is, is doing is not really, uh, we, we don't have a, st a stimulus to, to do that. So um, I think uh, uh, lines of credit specific to regenerative agriculture is something really that we should work for to, to have it and to stimulate, uh, to adapt option. Uh, we're working hard to try to make uh, the cost of implementation uh, not as much higher than conventional, but uh, that's not so easy. Uh, what are you doing uh, to deal with that? Uh, our strategy, I think I already mentioned, is to put short-term crops that uh, produce uh, uh, produce money uh, earlier, so we minim minimize the the amount of cash that we need to to implement the systems. Uh, that's that's the way we're dealing with that. Uh, but uh, we're still developing that yet. Thanks, Pedro. Ryan, do you have anything to add? Um, nothing, nothing to add beyond, I think there's a lot of opportunity, um, particularly with governments that have a fair amount of public land. Um, certainly there would be an opportunity there to utilize that. And one thing I've, I've noticed just you know, traveling around in different countries abroad is that there's a lot of funding um, particularly right now for, for job development, especially for young people. So I see agroforestry as an opportunity there to provide really dignified, solid employment because it, it's not something, you know, that can be completely 100% mechanized. So there's some sort of like knowledge base that you actually need to do it well. So I think there's a lot of opportunities as well, so long as that there's political will and enough pressure to be able to, to tap into those, those resources. All right. Thanks, Ryan. Um, we only have about a minute left. Let's do one last question. We might run a minute or two over, but I hope that's okay. Um, so this is a, this is a good one. <laughs> so agroforestry is a local model. It brings local solutions to regenerate ecosystems and provide sustainable production. On the other hand, climate change has a global effect and requires global solutions. Are these compatible or are they two different conceptions of the problem? Does anyone want to take a stab at agroforestry as a global climate solution? <laughs> I can try if you like. Sure. Well, if the, broadly speaking, um, if you want uh, climate mitigation, more trees is a really good idea and trees on farms have all these other benefits and so on. Um, 
that's a global solution and we could see global solutions looking at that through the the global climate finance system for example which does not really fund agroforestry at this point about 0.02 percent of the projects that are funded through the global climate finance system are agroforestry so there's room for substantial improvement there uh some countries, uh, India has kind of taken the lead on this, are starting to get national agroforestry policies in place, which is really big. Uh, countries that have signed on to the Paris Agreement, which is almost everyone, uh, are required to, um, to uh, well, have submitted these national, nationally determined contribution plans. Some of them include agroforestry now, and in five years when they renew, I'd like to see lots more countries sign up for that, and that's a way for countries to get credit through the international system for both the mitigation and adaptation benefits of agroforestry. So I think that's going to be a really big way to see agroforestry um, come in. Um, that's sort of like at the national level, at the, but but the implementation of those things in every case has to be very local. Which trees, what farming systems, <laughs> uh, what markets, uh, all of those things have to be really local and that requires a, um, you know, every valley and every mountainside kind of needs its own system developed in a way or its own set of systems developed. So that is a very decentralized and democratic effort that has to be would ideally be supported by academia national research and so on and at this point it is in some places and often this and often we're really out there kind of um figuring it out with a relatively low budget yeah okay well thanks for taking a stab at that eric um i know we're already a little bit over time but let's do a quick closing round maybe just kind of 30 seconds from each of our presenters today any kind of closing remarks or things you want to share with the audience how to get in touch with you um, Eric, do you want to start? Sure, it's a great pleasure being here and a great panel. Um, uh, folks can reach me through Drawdown. I'm Eric at drawdown.org. And uh, like I said, a lot of our stuff is up on the web. I also have my own website for the book, which is uh, um, carbonfarming.org, which has tons of resources and information and videos and all manner of stuff that people are welcome to go check out. Awesome. Thanks, Eric. Uh, Pedro? Well, thank you. It's a great panel. I'm very happy to be here. And uh, one thing that I, I think just for the last question is I think it's very important that I mentioned briefly on my presentation that I think uh, biodiversity is something that uh, this kind of system of regenerative agroforest systems uh, really address. And that's a problem that we're not talking much uh, yet, but it's a big problem on the planet. And uh, I think that's uh, something that uh, makes the problem globally uh, and make the solution of agroforestry kind of globally because it's really regional. The solutions is really regional, but the problem of biodiversity, even of climate change, and uh, it's, uh, it's global. So I think it connected everything. But, um, uh, well, to... to to contact me is through the Fazenda Talker website, uh, and uh, there is my email there, and then you can uh, email me. And, and I'm pretty open to to answer questions and be connected with everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pedro, and Ryan. Well, great. I just want to thank everybody for attending today. This was a great uh, presentation. I want to thank the presenters and. Um, you know, at, at Grow Ahead, we do a number of webinars pretty regularly with different topics, mostly related about the, the work that we do. Um, to get in touch with us, please visit our website, um, growahead.org, or on any of the social media channels. And uh, yeah, we really appreciate your support. Thank you all so much. Okay, well, a huge, huge thank you to Eric and Ryan and Pedro for taking the time to share more about your work and talk about agroforestry more broadly. We really appreciate it. Um, to everyone out there listening, we've had a lot of requests for links to resources and associations mentioned, so we'll aggregate those and circulate them. Um, and yeah, thanks again for all of our co-organizers, Project Drawdown, Regeneration Canada, Fazenda de Toca, and Grow Ahead. Uh, this webinar has been recorded and we'll share it with all of you afterwards. Um, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love your feedback. Um, thank you all once again and hope you have a great day. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.